Hey there everyone, it's Mr. Lane here. And in this lecture, we will look at Baroque art in Northern Europe. Take good notes and let's begin. Key ideas include the Thirty Years' War, which was a 17th century religious conflict fought primarily in Central Europe. It remains one of the longest and most brutal wars in human history with more than 8 million casualties resulting from military battles, as well as from the famine and disease caused by the conflict. In the end, the conflict changed the geopolitical face of Europe and the role of religion and nation states in society. There was a heightened mercantilism worldwide. Mercantilism is an economic theory that advocates government regulation of international trade to generate wealth and strengthen national power. In Flanders, they were primarily Catholic. Art, art was similar to Spain and Italy, and it was an aristocratic patronage. In the Dutch Republic, which was primarily Protestant, they rejected religious art in favor of private commissions. Examples include portraits, genre scenes, landscapes, and still lives. In France and England, they were known for grand architecture. Here's a list of our key terms. These are the artworks we will be analyzing. In 1648, after decades of continuous border disputes with the Spaniards, the Northern Netherlands achieved official recognition as the United Provinces of the Netherlands, the Dutch Republic. The new independent republic owed its ascendance largely to its success in international trade. Dutch ships laden with goods roamed the world, sailing as far as North and South America, Western Africa, China, Japan, and the Pacific Islands spreading prosperity to a greatly expanded middle class. Although steeped in the morality and propriety central to the Calvinist ethic, members of the Dutch middle class sought ways to announce their success in newly acquired status. House furnishings, paintings, tapestries, and porcelain were among the items they collected and displayed in their houses. Let's look at an artist from Flanders. The greatest 17th century Flemish painter was Peter Paul Rubens, a towering figure in the history of Western art. Rubens built on the innovations of the Italian Renaissance and Baroque masters to formulate the first truly pan-European painting style. To produce a steady stream of paintings for a rich and powerful international clientele, Rubin deployed scores of assistants. He also became a highly successful art dealer, buying and selling contemporary artworks and classical antiques for royal and aristocratic clients throughout Europe, who competed with one another in, in amassing vast collections of paintings and sculptures. This is Rubin's Elevation of the Cross. One aim of this type of painting was to help enforce Catholic ideology during the Counter-Reformation. Rubens is painting this altarpiece at a moment that was important for two reasons. One, he just came back from Italy and absorbed the lessons of the Italian Renaissance, Baroque and classical antiquity. And two, there was a truce that had just been signed by the Dutch provinces in the north, and so Antwerp was gaining stability. An opportunity for large-scale commissions inside of churches was growing. Here you can see just how large the painting is. later moved to the city's cathedral. The altarpiece, in the form of a triptych, 
is one of numerous commissions for religious works that Rubens received at this time. By investing in sacred art, Flemish churches sought to affirm their allegiance to Catholicism and Spanish Habsburg rule after a period of Protestant iconoclastic fervor in the region. This was an important moment for the Eucharist because it is the moment when Christ sheds his blood for the sins of mankind. This is a representation of Christ as a physical figure. The bread and wine symbolizes the body and blood of Christ. The men in Rubens' paintings are very muscular, like the men Michelangelo painted on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. Rubens also paid close attention to details, similar to the Northern Renaissance tradition of artists like John Van Eyck. We can also see similarities to Caravaggio with the use of diagonals and figure placement. Rubens was also influenced by art from ancient Greece and Rome. This is the right wing in which we see a foreshortened horse rider by a Roman authority figure and two thieves who would be attached to the cross as well. In the left wing, we see Mary and St. John. The Dutch Republic. With the founding of the Bank of Amsterdam, in 1609, Amsterdam emerged as the financial center of the continent. In the 17th century, the city had the highest per capita income in Europe. The Dutch economy also benefited enormously from the country's expertise on the open seas, which facilitated establishing lucrative trade routes to ports as far away as Japan, Africa, and South America. Due to the prosperity and in the absence of the absolute ruler, political power increasingly passed into the hands of a wealthy class of merchants and manufacturers, especially in cities such as Amsterdam. All of these bustling cities like Amsterdam, Harlem, and Delft were located in Holland, the largest of the seven United Provinces, which explains why many historians informally use the name Holland to refer to the entire country. Rembrandt was a leading Dutch painter of his time, an undisputed genius, an artist of great versatility, a master of light and shadow, and a unique interpreter of the Protestant conception of Holy Scripture. Born in Leiden, he moved to Amsterdam around 1631, where he could attract a more extensive clientele than possibly in his native city. Rembrandt had trained as a history painter in Leiden, but in Amsterdam, he immediately entered the lucrative market for portraiture and soon became renowned for that genre. Here's Rembrandt's Return of the Prodigal Son. The Calvinist injunction against religious art did not prevent Rembrandt from making a series of religious paintings and prints. In the Dutch Republic, Paintings depicting biblical themes were not objects of devotion, but they still brought great prestige. And Rembrandt and other artists aimed to demonstrate their ability to represent in dramatic new ways the stories narrated in Holy Scripture. The Dutch artist's psychological insight and his profound sympathy for human affliction produced, at the end of his life, one of the most moving pictures in the history of biblical art, The Return of the Prodigal Son. In this Old Testament parable, the younger of two sons leaves his home and squanders his wealth on a life of sin. When he becomes poor and hungry and sees the error of his ways, he returns home. In Rembrandt's painting, the forgiving father tenderly embraces his lost son, 
who crouches before him in weeping contrition, while three figures immersed to varying degrees in the soft shadows note the lesson of mercy. Here's a question to consider. How does Rembrandt's painting differ from Baroque paintings of religious subjects from other realms, like Rubens? Also, how does the light differ? Another question to consider. Does light contribute to the meaning of this image? Among the hallmarks of the style of Rembrandt is his masterful use of light and shade. Rembrandt's pictorial method involved refining light and shade into finer and finer areas until they blended with one another. In fact, the recording of light in small gradations is closer to reality because the eye perceives light and dark not as static, but is always subtly changing. Rembrandt discovered for the modern world that variations of light and shade, subtly modulated, can be read as emotional differences. In the visible world, light, dark, and the wide spectrum of values between the two are charged with meanings and feelings that sometimes are independent of the shapes and figures they modify. The theater and the photographic arts have used these discoveries to great dramatic effect. Our next artist is Vermeer with the painting Woman Holding a Balance. This image gives you a sense of the scale of the painting. This woman, who could have been the wife of Vermeer as the model, is part of the merchant class in Holland. The cap on her head was made of linen commonly worn for women when they were at home. In her right hand is a balance. The box in front of her has pearls and coins, a sign of her material wealth. Maybe she's weighing her valuables. The painting in the back shows Christ functioning as, as judge, judging the souls of the blessed and damned. This is called the Last Judgment. A camera obscura is a darkened box with a convex lens or aperture for projecting the image of an external object onto a screen inside. It is important historically in the development of photography. Art historians debate if Vermeer used mirrors and a camera obscura because in the painting, he included parts that appear out of focus, suggesting he used a lens. Let's now look at a couple of artists from France. Nicolas Poisson was the leading proponent of classical painting in 17th century Rome. The Grand Manor is a style considered appropriate for noble and stately matters. It's an English term for the highest style of art and academic theory based on the idealized classical approach. The characters you see here include ancient shepherds and a classical female figure. In the center is a tomb. This is describing a poetic passage of time. You can see direct influence from the classical architecture and sculpture. The text on the tomb is referring to death, as well as the person inside of the tomb. The word Arcadia is understood as a mythic, ideal place.
Here we have Judith Leister's Self-Portrait, which is an example of a genre painting. These are paintings of subjects from everyday life, and usually small in scale. While the casual feel of Leister's self-portrait departs from the formality that had been conventional for artists' portraits, other aspects of her image remain connected to tradition. From the 16th century, artists had tried to win acceptance of painting as a liberal art, promoting it as a profession, not merely a manual craft. They hoped to see the visual arts elevated to the same level as the liberal arts of literature, philosophy, and rhetoric. Painters therefore depicted themselves in fine clothes and with elegant demeanor, emphasizing their status. Leicester's dress is a rich fabric. The aim was the same goal of celebrating her success and separating her from less sophisticated artisans. It has also been suggested that her open speaking smile makes a subtle reference to the art of poetry and its relationship to painting. Our last painting is by Peter Claus, titled Venita Still Life. Venitas means vanity. Here is a painting symbolizing the transient nature of reality, earthly life, and pleasure. Thanks for watching everyone. Here are some additional resources for you to access.